In the Time of the Butterflies by Julie Alvarez, Part 3, <clears throat> Chapter 12, Part A, Minerva, August to November 25th, 1960, House Arrest, August and September. All my life I've been trying to get out of the house. Papa always complained that, of his four girls, I should have been the boy born to cut loose. First, I wanted to go to boarding school, then university. When Manolo and I started the underground, I traveled back and forth from Monte Cristi to Salcido, connecting cell with cell. I couldn't stand the idea of being locked up in any one life. So when we were released in August and put under house arrest, you'd have thought I was getting just the punishment for me. But to tell the truth, it was as if I had been as if I had been served my sentence on a silver platter. By then I couldn't think of anything I wanted more than to stay home with my sisters at Mama's, raising our children. Those first few weeks at home took some getting used to. After seven months in prison, a lot of that time in solitary, the overload was too much. The phone ringing, a visitor dropping by, with permission from Pena, of course. Pena himself dropping by to see about the visitor. Don Bernardo with guavas from his tree. Rooms to go in and out of. Children wanting their shoelaces tied. The phone ringing again. And what to do with the curdled milk. In the middle of the day, when I should have been out soaking up sun and getting good country air in my infected lungs, I would seek the quiet of the bedroom, slip out of my dress and lie under the sheets watching the sun speckled, speckling the leaves through the barely open jealousies. But as I lay there, the same overload would start happening in my head. Bits and pieces of the past would bob up in the watery soup of my thoughts those days. Leo explaining how to hit the volleyball so there was a curve in its fall. The rain falling on our way to Papa's funeral, my hand coming down on Trujillo's face, the doctor slapping her first breath into my newborn baby girl. I'd sit up, shocked at what I was letting happen to me. I'd been so much stronger and braver in prison. Now at home, I was falling apart. Or I thought, lying back down, I'm ready for a new life, and this is how it starts. I grew stronger gradually and began taking part in the life of the household. None of us had any money, and the dwindling income from the farm had been stretched mighty thin across five families. So we started up a specialty business of children's christening gowns. I did the simple stitching and the seam binding. The pneumonia in my lungs cleared up. I got my appetite back and began to regain the weight I'd lost in prison. I could wear again my old clothes Doña Fafita had brought down from Monte Cristi. And of course, my children were a wonder. I'd swoop down on them, showering them with kisses. Mommy, they'd shriek. How lovely to be called mother again, to have their little arms around my neck, their sane, sweet breath in my face. And pinto beans. They were always so colorful. Wait, wait, wait. I'd cry out to Fella before she dunked them in the water. I'd scoop up handfuls just to hear the soft rattle of their downpour back in the pot. Everything I had to touch, everything I had to taste. I wanted everything back in my life again. But sometimes a certain slant of light would send me back. The light used to fall just so, at this time of day, on the floor below my top bunk. And once, Manu got a hold of a piece of pipe and was rallying it against the Galleria rail. It was a sound exactly recalling the guards in prison running their nightsticks against the bars. I ran out and yanked the pipe from her hand, screaming, No! My poor little girl burst out crying, frightened by the terror in my voice. But those memories, too, began to fade. They became stories. Everyone wanted to hear them. Mate and I could keep the house entertained for hours, telling and retelling the horrors until the sting was out of them. We were allowed two outings a week, Thursdays to La Victoria to visit the men, Sundays to church. But for all that I, but for all that I was free to travel, I dreaded going out of the house. The minute we turned onto the road, my heart started pounding and my breathing got shallow. The open vistas distressed me. The sense of being adrift in a crowd of people pressing in on all sides, wanting to touch me, greet me, wish me well. Even in church, during the privacy of Holy Communion, Father Gabriel bent down and whispered, Viva la Mariposa. My months in prison had elevated me to superhuman status. It would hardly have been seemly for someone who had challenged our dictator to suddenly succumb to a nervous attack at the communion rail. I hid my anxieties and gave everyone a bright smile. If they had only known how frail was their iron will heroine, how much it took to put on that hardest of all performances, 
being my old self again. My best performances were reserved for Pena's visits. He came often to supervise our house arrest. The children got so used to his toad face and grabby hands they began calling him Tio Capitan and asked to hold his gun and ride on his knee horse. I myself could not get used to him. Whenever that big white Mercedes turned into our narrow driveway, I ran to my bedroom and shut the door to give myself time to put on my old self face. In no time, someone was sent back there to get me. It's Pena. You've got to come. Even Mama, who once refu refused to receive him, now buttered him up whenever he was over. After all, he had let her have her babies back. One afternoon, I was trimming the laurel in the front yard. Manolito was quote unquote helping me after cutting the branches all but a sliver I held them I held him up to pull them off from his perch on my shoulders he reported all he saw out on the road Tio's car he cried out and sure enough I saw the flash of white through a break in the hedge it was too late to tune up for my performance I went directly to the carport to receive him what a rare occasion Doña Minerva the last few times I've come you haven't been well in other words, I've noticed your rudeness. All of it is filed away. You must be feeling better, he observed without a question mark. I saw your car. I saw your car, sang Manolito. Manolito, my boy, you are all eyes. We could use men like you in the sim. Oh, God, I thought. Ladies, it's nice to have you all here, Pena noted. Then Mate and Patria joined us on the patio. The day had appeared with her shears to work on the hedge and keep her eye on things. Whenever she didn't like my tone, she would clip the crown of thorns violently, scattering a spray of leaves and red petals in the air. For the upteenth time, Pena reminded us how lucky we were. Our five-year sentence had been commuted to house arrest. Instead of the restrictions of prison, we had only a few rules to obey. We called them Pena's commandments. He rehearsed them each time he came. No trips, no visitors, no contact with politicals, any exceptions only by his permission. Clear? We nodded. I was tempted to bring out the broom and set it by the door the country way to tell people it was time to go. Pena dunked uh, the bobbing ice cubes with his fat finger. Today he had come uh, for more than the recital of his rules. El Jefe has not visited our province for a while now, he began. Of course not, I thought. Most families in Salcido had at least one son or daughter, or husband, in prison. We are trying to get him to come. All loyal citizens are writing letters. Clip, clip, went Dede's shears, as if to drown out anything I might be thinking. El Jefe has been very generous to you girls. It would be nice if you composed a letter of thanks for his leniency. He glanced at me and Mate, resting his eyes on Patria last. We gave him nothing with our faces. Poor nervous Dede who had edged up the patio uh, towards us and was rewatering all the plants, uh, said that, yes, that would be wise. I mean nice, she corrected herself quickly, and Patria, Mate, and I bowed our heads to hide our smiles. After Pena left, there was a fight. The others wanted to go ahead and write the damn letter, but I was against it. Thank Trujillo for punishing us? But what harm can a little, a little letter do, Mate argued. It was no longer so easy for me to talk that one into anything. People look to us to be an example. We've got a responsibility. I spoke so fiercely, they looked a little sheepish. My old self was putting on quite a show. Now Minerva, Patria reasoned, you know if he publishes the silly thing, everyone will know why we wrote it. Just go along with us on this one, this one time, Mate pleaded with me. It reminded me of that time in Amacalada when I had not wanted to perform for Trujillo with my friends, but I, but I had given in to them, and we almost met our end too with Sunita's bow and uh, excuse me bow and arrow assassination attempt. What finally convinced me was Patria's argument that the letter might help free the men. A grateful note from the Mirabal sisters might just soften El Jefe's heart towards our husbands. Heart, I said, making a face. Then sitting down to our task, I made it perfectly clear. This is against my better principles. Someone needs to have less principles and more sense, they murmured, but without much fight in her voice. I think she was relieved to see a little spark of the old Minerva again. 
Afterwards, I felt small with what I'd done. We've got to do something, I kept muttering. Calm down, Minerva. Here, the day said, pulling down Gandhi from the shelf. Elsa had given me this book when I first got out of prison to show me, she said, that being passive and gentle could be revolutionary. The day had approved wholeheartedly. Today, Gandhi would not do. What I needed was a shot of Fidel's fiery rhetoric. He would have agreed with me. We had to do something, soon. We have to accept this cross, is what we have to do, Patria said. Like hell we do, I said. I was on a rampage. It lasted only until the end of that day. We were already in bed when I heard them talking loudly on the porch. They were everywhere. The dark glasses, the iron pants, the pomaded hair. They stayed on the road until night, uh, when they drew close to the house like moths drawn towards the light. Usually I covered my head with my pillow and after a while fell asleep, but tonight I could not ignore them. I got up from bed, not even bothering to throw a shawl over my nightgown. They, they caught me going out the door. She tried to hold me back, but weak though I w still was, I pushed her aside easily. The day was still the day, without much conviction in her fighting. Two sim agents were sitting on our rockers as comfortable as you please. Compañeros, I said, startling them in mid-rock with a revolutionary greeting. I'm going to have to ask you to please keep your voices down. We're right un You're right under our bedroom windows. Remember, you are guards, not guests here. Neither of them said a word. Well, if there's nothing else, good night then, compañeros. I had turned back towards the door when one of them called out, Viva Trujillo, the patriotic way of beginning and closing the day. But I wasn't going to invoke the devil's name in my own yard. After a short pause in which she was probably waiting to see if I'd answer, they they called from inside the house, Viva Trujillo. Viva Trujillo, Made took up, and then a couple more voices had their good wishes to our dictator until what had been a scared compliance became, by the exaggeration of repetition, a joke. But I could feel the men listening specifically for my loyalty call. Viva, I began and felt ashamed as I took a deep breath and pronounced the hated name. Just in case I should go on a rampage again, Mama confiscated the old radio. What we need to do now, what we need to know, we'll know soon enough. And she was right, too. Little bits of news leaked in, sometimes from the least likely people. My old friend Elsa. She had married the journalist Roberto Suarez, who was assigned to the National Palace, and though critical of the regime, wrote the flowery feature articles required of him. One night long ago, he kept Manolo and me, as well as Elsa, in stitches with tales of his journalistic escapades. He'd been held in prison once for three days for printing a picture in which Trujillo's bare leg showed between the cuff of his pants and the top of his sock. Another time, a misprint he hadn't caught, Roberto's article had stated that Senator Smathers had delivered an elegy instead of a eulogy of Trujillo before the joint members of the United States Congress. That time, Roberto was put in jail for a month. I had thought for sure the Suarezes would join our movement, so when Leandro moved to the capital to coordinate the cells there, I mentioned the Suarezes to him as a likely couple. Elsa and Roberto were contacted and declared themselves friendly, but did not want to join. Now, in my hard times, my old friend sprang to my side. Every week since our release in August, Elsa had driven up from the capital to visit her elderly grandfather in La Vega. She would swing up to Santiago, butter up Peña, she was good at this, and pass and get a pass to come see me. Knowing we were uh, in straightened circumstances, she brought bags of old clothes that looked fairly new to me. She claimed she couldn't fit into anything after her babies had been born, and she'd gotten big as a cow. Elsa, always exaggerating. She had the same good figure as always, as far as I could tell. But look at these hips, please, just look at these legs, she'd remind me. Once she asked me, how do you stay so trim? Her eyes ran over my figure in an appraising way. Prison, I said flatly. She didn't mention my figure again. Elsa and Roberto owned a boat, and every weekend they took it out. To fish, Elsa winked. At sea, they picked up swan broadcasts from a little island south of Cuba, as well as Radio Rebelde in Cuba and Radio Rumbos from Venezuela. It's a regular newsroom out there, said Elsa, every visit catching me up on the latest news. 
One day Elsa appeared, her face flushed with excitement. She couldn't sit down for a minute, not even for her favorite pastelito snack. She had news to tell me that required an immediate walk in the garden. What is it, I said, clutching her arm when we were halfway down the anthuriums. The OAS has imposed sanctions. Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela. Elsa counted them off with her fingers. Even the gringos. They've all broken relations. She and Roberto had been out of the boat out on the boat Sunday and even an American and seen an American warship on the horizon. The capital is like this. Elsa rubbed her fingers together. Roberto says by next year. Next year? I was alarmed. By then, who knows what can happen? We walked a little while in silence. Far off, I could hear the shouts of the children playing with the big, bright beach ball their Tia Elsa had brought them from the capital. The day tells me I shouldn't talk to you about this, about all of this. But I said to her, the day, it's in Minerva's blood. I told her about that time you almost shot Trujillo with the toy arrow, remember? I had to step in and pretend it was part of our play. I wondered which of us had revised the past to suit the lives we were living now. Aye, Elsa, that's, a, that's not how it happened. Tell anyhow, well, anyhow, she told me about the time you freed your father's rabbits because you didn't think it was right to have them caged. That story was remembered my way, but I felt diminished hearing it. And look at me now. What do you mean? You've gained a little weight. You're looking great. She ran her eyes over me, nodding in approval. Minerva, Minerva, I'm so proud of you. How much I wanted at that moment to unburden myself to my old friend, to confess that I didn't feel the same as before prison, that I wanted my own life back again. But before I could say a thing, she grabbed my hands. Viva la mariposa, she whispered with feeling. I gave her the bright, brave smile she also required of me. Our spirits were so high with good news, we couldn't wait for Thursday to tell the men. The night before, we were almost festive as we rolled our hair in the bedroom so it would curl for our men uh, the next day. We always did this no matter how gloomy we were feeling, and they noticed it too. It was a fact. We had all compared notes that our men got more romantic the longer they were in prison. <laughs> Patrick claimed that Padrito, a man of few words, if, ever, if there ever was one, was composing love poems for her and reciting them during visiting hours. The most embarrassing part, she admitted, was that this made her start feeling that way, right there in the middle of the prison, hall surrounded by guards. The day sat by, watching our preparations with displeasure. She had gotten into the habit of staying over the nights before our visits. She said she had to be at Mama's early the next day anyhow, to help with all the children once we left. But really, she was there to convince us not to go. You're exposing yourselves to an accident by going down altogether, they, they began. That's what you're doing. We all knew what kind of accident she meant. Just a month ago, Marrero had been found at the foot of a cliff, having supposedly lost control of his car. Bernigal's drivers are very reliable, Patria reassured her. Think of how many orphans you'd be leaving behind, how many widowers, a mother de luto for the rest of her life, that they could really pour on the tragedy. I didn't know if it was nerves or what, but all three of us burst out laughing. The day stood up and announced she was going home. Come on, the day, I called as she, as she headed out the door. There's a curfew. Be reasonable. Reasonable? Her voice was seething with anger. If you think I'm going to sit by and watch you all commit suicide, you're wrong. She didn't make it past the front gate. The sim sent her back. She slept on the couch and the next morning wouldn't talk to us all through breakfast. When she turned away, as we went to kiss her goodbye, I decided to use her own fears on her. Come on, Dede. Think how sorry you'd be if something would happen to us and you didn't say goodbye. She stiffened with resistance, but the second driver turned on the engine. She ran to the car, sobbing. <clears throat> she blurted out the one loss she hadn't mentioned the night before. I don't want to have to live without you.